ever disturbed by your own writing? Do you ever have to sort of walk away from your... Is, does it bother your dreams? Does it... Um, there are times when I sort of creep myself out. So I'll be... I, when I was writing this quite early on, I rented a house in Northumberland, which is the part of England which I set this, this book, and I rented a house by the sea, and I was there by myself. And there are times at night where I had to like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch some reality TV now because this is really like, oh. you know, I could hear the footsteps on the stairs and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I do, I do do that to myself, and particularly if I'm by myself, and particularly if I'm not in, a, you know, in cities, I always feel safe weirdly. But anyway, that's just me. Yeah. Hey everybody, thanks for coming out on this hot night. Um, Ms. Paula Hawkins, I've been thinking about you, and I could be completely wrong here, but I keep imagining that your experience of the girl on the train must be akin to that of a gold miner or an oil driller. You have this instinct, this idea, maybe you borrow a little money, maybe you're a little panicked about doing it, but you keep digging at it, you keep working, and then the miracle occurs and you strike. 18 million copies sold worldwide, a hit movie, freaking Emily Blunt, <laughs> playing your heroine. I imagine that there's an, a couple of minutes there where you just sort of stand back and look at everything with your mouth open. Um, Ms. Hawkins was born in Zimbabwe and moved to London with her family at 17. She studied philosophy at Oxford, along with politics and economics. I wonder if that helped prepare you for all of this. Her second novel, Into the Water, that's her second under her own name, that is. We'll talk about that later. It proves that whatever mysterious alchemy went into getting you here, the girl on the train was no accident. In this new book, there are witches, maybe. There are heartbroken family members coping with tragedy. There's the eternal mystery of memory. And there are big questions. What if you misremember something crucial? Can we ever know anyone, even our own family? Sophomore books can be fraught, but with this one, Ms. Hawkins m has become such a go-to writer, especially if you like psychological menace mixed with social unease and characters who refuse to be reduced to any one thing. The suspense she creates, and she creates a lot of it, comes directly from character. How do people react armed with new information? How does our shifting inner life affect our actions? I'm so pleased she's here to talk about this with us. Please welcome Paula Hawkins. So, hi, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm, I've heard you in various interviews say that one of the impetuses behind your stories is the idea of ordinary lives gone wrong. And I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. What's dramatic about that? Well, I think, um, yeah, those are the kind of stories that I'm drawn to. Those are the stories that I'm interested in. I'm, I was never going to be the type of a writer who wrote about spies or maybe you know serial killers or that kind of thing there is obviously there is you know space for that and there's huge appetite for that in some quarters but i was i'm the stories i'm drawn to are the ones the things you read in the newspaper when you these it's an ordinary family who've been just getting on with their lives and something terrible has happened and i'm always so fascinated by how did they get to that point and where do they go afterwards how do you how do you cope with and recover from um grief or fear and how do you and how how do people's relationships get so messed up that they, they end up doing terrible things to each other? Now, that makes me sound like a really bad person, but I do think it's actually incredibly interesting. Yeah. Because it's usually not out of the desire to cause harm a lot no. of the time. No, it's just bad decisions and, you know, strange um, happenstance a lot of the time that leads people into really terrible places. And as we've seen in politics, it's not the crime, it's the cover-up, right, some of the time? <laughs> <laughs> um, you also specialize in, in women characters, and you've put them, y y you've uh, sort of categorized them as women who take up too much space. What does that mean to you? Well, yeah, in this book in particular, I was, I'm dealing with women who are troublesome in one way or another, and I, that troublesome is in big, you know, quotes, because women can be troublesome in so many ways by speaking up, by, as I said, taking up too much space, by... Which, which can mean anything. It can mean being the wrong body shape or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are all these ways in which women are criticized for just getting on with their lives half the time or you know, the ways in which they lead their lives. And that, that was what I'm 
particularly picking over in Into the Water is all the ways in which women can be silenced or asked to pipe down, um, you know. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm talking about in this book. And how we pipe ourselves down. I mean, I remember sitting in business meetings where all the men are like, anyway, you know, <laughs> they just take up and all the women sort of sit like this. And it's like baboons or something. There's so much body language going on. Um, <laughs> she's wisely not commenting on that. <laughs> no, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's so, no, I find my, you know, one finds oneself self-censoring in so many situations, particularly in, you know, um, speaking at things or on social media. You, you're you about to, to tweet something and then you sort of think, actually, what kind of terrible nonsense will this bring down on my head? And then you so you censor yourself, even though it was a completely legitimate opinion. Have you had any Twitter wars, any trolls, anyone come after you? N no, but probably because I'm quite careful. I mean, I d I've mostly I just talk about books on Twitter and I'm not, I, I like, you know, I tell people, uh, you know, I like to have discussions about things I've enjoyed. And so I'm quite inane. <laughs> um, <laughs> I will. I like to talk about books. I don't tend, to, if I'm going to talk politics, I'll keep that quiet and private. And, you know, I am a political animal, but I do, yeah, I'm not going, I'm not interested in getting into uh, you know, those kind of social media rows. I think they take over your life, and I think they do invite the most, un you know, unbelievable nastiness, which I don't want to have to cope with in my day-to-day. -day. Yeah, I hear you on that. There are sometimes I can't help engaging, though. It's like, I, I think, stop it, and then I do it anyway. Um, what kind of a kid were you? Um, <coughs> I was quite... Um, Quiet, I suppose. Well, actually, my, my parents would object to that. They said I talked all the time. But I wasn't, I was, you know, I sort of babbled. I liked to make up stories. I had this, my mother always says, this crazy imagination. Um, she claims that I used to, we used to go to this place in South Africa the, at the beach, and I used to talk to, to rocks and shells and things. And I was always engaged in, like, lively conversation with things. Um, so, you know, I, was, I had a happy childhood. I had a a very sort of outdoorsy childhood in Africa. And that there was a lot of, you know, there was no daytime TV and obviously none of the internet things we have. So, and that lends itself to a, to a creative imagination. And I did read a lot, although I was not a highbrow reader as a child or as a teenager. There was a lot of Enid Blyton and C.S. Lewis and Agatha Christie inevitably, which is, you know, was important for me. But, you know, there was also some, there was a shameful Danielle Steele phase too, you know. <laughs> No shame, no shame. Um, because of your father's profession, uh, I've read that journalists would come to your place for dinner and you became sort of enamored of that life. Is that right? Yeah, my father is an academic, um, but he also wrote for the Financial Times, still does occasionally, um, and he knew a lot of journalists and people used to come to interview him. And we often had journalists come and stay at the house and they were, you know, they were foreign correspondents. They'd traveled around Africa. They'd been held at gunpoint in weird places. And, you know, they had these, all these amazing stories. So I, th and it sounded terribly glamorous to me. And also they were often, they seemed like crusading types, you know, they were, they were on the right side of things. I see, so also I thought, so I had this, these aspirations to be this intrepid foreign correspondent, you know, telling the truth and whatnot. But it turned out that I wasn't really suited to that kind of life because I'm a coward. And um, I wouldn't be able to go to these places. So, But that, that was why I wanted to become a journalist, really. When did you actually start writing things down? And do you remember the first thing that actually gave you pleasure to write? Oh, I mean, I used to write stories as a child all the time. I, do, I don't remember what those stories were about or anything. I'm not, I don't have that kind of memory. But, um, yeah, I, I wrote... Creative writing was important for me when I was little. I then had a teenage phase when I was fiercely political and earnest, and I just read nonfiction and didn't worry about like those sorts of fripperies. But then, as when I got into my twenties and thirties, I was writing, starting novels all the time that never went anywhere, and I never showed anything to anybody. And they were, I'm sure, they were terrible. Um, and I don't even know where most of them are now. They'll be on hard hard drive somewhere. But yeah, I did. Uh, it's something I've always taken refuge in. I think taken refuge, gosh, a lot of people would say the opposite, right? You, you're not an angsty writer, it's not sort of agony for you? It can be, but I actually find more and more, the less time I have to write, the more I miss it. And it has always been for me a little bit of a refuge, a solace, in fact, if things are going bad, badly in my actual life, you can go into fiction and dis you know disappear into something where you don't have to think about how rubbish your life is or how 
anxious you are about the reception of the book or what have you, if you just turn to the next story, or an, you know, it's a, it's a nice way to, to escape from things. Right. Ah. Um, at Oxford, you studied philosophy, politics, and economics. What, um, what prompted you to do that? Um, PPE is a very standard Oxford degree. It's basically what all politicians do. Um, you know, all and po politicians, journalists, and often people who go on to become lawyers. It's a, yeah, it's a standard degree. And I and at that time, I wanted to do journalism. It's like a big generalist thing. So um, and yeah, I enjoyed it. I dropped the economics fairly quickly because I'm <laughs> terrible at maths. But um, yeah, I, I I enjoyed it very much. Was there a job or or a moment when you realized like hey, I'm doing this for real? Like I am a writer now. Mm. I think I've always had a bit of the imposter syndrome and the kind of when am I going to be found out and that that sort of dogged me through my career. I never felt like I was a great, I was very, a very effective journalist. Um, I, li I enjoyed the writing, but I didn't enjoy the story getting. I'm quite di diffident in a lot of ways and I didn't want to sort of uh, ask the questions that needed to be asked. Or if I asked a question and people didn't want to answer, I'd be like, okay, fine, which is not really <laughs> what you're supposed to do as a journalist. Um, but it was, you know, it's in journalism is interesting in lots of ways. It's great training for a fiction writer, actually. It teaches you to edit yourself and to strip out the unnecessary, and it also teaches you to to sort of try and read between the lines of what people are telling you and, you know, what they're not telling you. And I think that is actually a, a useful thing for a fiction writer, to, to have that in their mind when they're writing, the way people speak and the way they try to hide things and obfuscate. Yeah, you don't have to answer my question. I'll go make it up. <laughs> <laughs> You had a distinguished career at the Times, then you freelanced, then 09 came, and all of us journalists suffered. Um, your agent directed you to, to a, 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 a twist in your career. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I had an agent because I'd written a nonfiction book, and sh um, she approached me to write a sort of romantic comedy, um, which a publisher had requested, and they basically they had the character and the set up for this book and they just wanted someone to write it really quickly and the reason they approached me was it be because their 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 main character was this young woman who loses her job as a result of the financial crisis and the recession and they thought because i was a financial journalist i understood the financial crisis and the recession it was ludicrous but anyway um they came to me and they said you know you've eight weeks to write this book so i went off and i wrote a novel in eight weeks and you know it, it was fine, but it, it kind of reads like a novel that was written in eight weeks, I think. Um, but it did okay, and then they asked me for another one, and this time they didn't give me like the full story arc. They just said, can you do a heartwarming Christmas romance? So um, I went off. <laughs> so off I went. I mean, it was just so, I was so not suited to that kind of writing. But I, I you know, I did it. I did four novels under, the, uh, under a pseudonym, and they were, and two of them did kind of quite quite well, actually, not on this kind of scale, but they, they did fine. Um, but, you know, they kept getting darker and darker, and more and more <laughs> terrible things kept happening to all the characters. And then the, the last one had, you know, death and despair, and, and, you know, it wasn't really what people were coming to romantic comedy for. So, and nobody bought it, the last one, unfortunately. And I'd spent two years writing it, and it was quite a... You know, I put a lot of myself into that book, and it was it was a bit of a blow when it did quite as badly as it did, and that's a devastating thing if you spent two years w working on a novel. And in any case, I pretty much meant I hadn't earned any money for quite some time. So it was clear that that was not my genre, and that it was time to move on and try something new. And I was I wasn't really sure what to do. I was thinking, well, I'll, I need to go back to journalism. I need to get a real job, and. Um, my agent was saying, "Look, you've been moving towards thrillers. That's actually what you want to write. Why don't you just try it, give it a go?" And I had, I came up with some ideas, and she said, "Oh yeah, the one about the drunk girl. I like the drunk girl because I'd talked to her about the drunk girl before, and um, that was Rachel. And there you go." I, I want to get to that really quickly, but I do have to ask you one more question mm. about the rom-coms. You had a pseudonym, Amy Silver. I did. How did you choose that? Um, it, well, it was kind of a, it was chosen by committee, I think. Um, we, got, we, you know, we came up with very, I think I wanted Jessica Silver. I thought that sounded terribly glamorous, but there were, apparently there were too many S's. Um, <laughs> it was just one of those things. I was never going to use my own name because, uh, you know, as I said, the first one really didn't come from me. I, I wasn't going to put my name on that, so... Um, and there was a nice thing, actually, for somebody who didn't have any 
confidence in themselves as a fiction writer, which I didn't, to have that distance of a pseudonym is, is, is comforting. You can kind of, at one remove, if you don't tell anybody, then nobody knows, because you know I wasn't doing tours and getting my picture taken, so it was a nice way sort of segue into fiction. Um, Did you have to Amy Silverize yourself to write them? Did you have to get no. into Amy's mindset? Oh no, not really. I still I still wrote them as me. Just I I tried to be funnier yeah. <laughs> and, and <laughs> failed. Um, but yeah, you know, I tried to I tried to to think of happy endings that I would like. And I that was I think was part of the problem that I could, uh, that I'm not just not a happy ending person. I find happy endings a little bit unsatisfying. It was a heartwarming Christmas till <laughs> Granny ended up dead. <laughs> um, what did you learn from writing them, though? You must have... Uh, did they sh did sharpen you up in any way? Oh, yeah, so much. Because, well, apart from anything else, the actual act of sitting down and writing an entire novel from start to finish is a thing in itself. Because, as I said, I'd started so many, and, and it's such a... I'm sure anyone who aspires to be a writer has done this. Write 10,000 words. Oh, no, this is rubbish. Chuck it out. Try a new idea be distracted by something else. And actually, you need to just push through, even if it's not the greatest thing. You know that it's going wrong and it's not that great. You need to push through to the end, and then you can ad assess your problems and address them. So just that was, was a start. And then, you know, it teaches you a lot about developing character and um, pacing and all sorts of things. So yeah, they were great training for me. And I don't think the girl on the train would have been the book it was if I hadn't already written four novels and gone through all the pain that I had. Um, I said, said this before, that there's always a time in, in a book where I sit at, the, at my desk and just weep. And um, I remember doing it for this book and for the book before, and my flatmate was like, you know, you do this every time. <laughs> you know, So just get over yourself and get through it. And that, that, that's part of the thing. It's just like pushing through those really those long, dark nights of the soul. What makes you weep? Oh, just when you, 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 you're convinced that, oh, this is dreadful, and I, now I've written 50,000 words, and I can't abandon it, but, and I don't know where it's going, and oh, aren't I you know, such failure, blah, blah. So you know, everyone has it. And then you like, pull yourself through it, and you, you find a way out. But yeah, I think every writer has that moment of complete, oh, I'm such a disaster. Do you know what a slinky is? The toy. That yeah, yeah, yeah. I have this slinky theory about writing that sometimes the slinky's all manageable, and then mm. sometimes the slinky's out of control <laughs> and twisted yeah. up, and you. Yeah, can't, yeah. yeah. Exactly. It's the twisted slinky. Did you have a specific inspiration? You mentioned the drunk girl. Was that a character that was living in your mind so much? And then, how did you get the drunk girl on the train? Mm. Talk about the evolution. Yeah, I had Rachel for a while in my head, and I was. She wasn't Rachel. She was somebody else, um, but I was interested in, <sighs> a lot of it ca comes down to the memory loss and the sort of relationship, how, how memory loss changes your relationship to your own actions. So if you can't remember what you did last night or yesterday or last week, it changes your sense of responsibility for those actions. And I'd read stuff about people who blacked out and committed crimes and then couldn't feel like properly guilty for them because they didn't remember either doing them or wanting to do those things. <coughs> and I just find that really interesting. So I was thinking about that and then, uh, so I gave her a drink problem which would give her blackouts and then I wondered why she had, a, why would she have a drink problem, this young woman, and I, you know, built around that. Um, but as I say, I tried her in a different book which was actually about sisters, um, and, but I couldn't get the plot to work. And I'd separately had this very rear window-ish kind of idea that had been born when I was doing my commuting and I'd sat on this train and uh, the train was always breaking down and it was right outside these people's houses and I'd stare into their windows and like hope that something interesting was gonna happen and nothing interesting ever happened. But I did wonder, you know, what would you do if you saw something, you know, shocking or what have you? And it was, it was, it was the sort of the bringing together of those two things um, that, that opened up a whole load of possibilities about perception and and reliability and, or, and all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, what was your state of mind when you embarked on this? <laughs> I mean, you were, you were leaving Amy Silver behind. I read that you actually had to borrow some, a bit of money from your dad. Um, what, what was this place that you were in? And, and do you think that informed what you wrote? Absolutely, I was, I, was, it was very, I was at a very low point, one way or another. Obviously, I talked about the last, the last Amy Silver was a disaster and I'd spent two years on it and I was, that's that's a hard thing to, to have, and I was just, what am I going to do? And uh, yes, I had to borrow money from my father, which is kind of humiliating when you're 
40. So, um, you know, that it, <laughs> it was not a good time. But all that I did, once I had the idea for the girl on the train, all that like misery and self-loathing and what got went straight into Rachel. And I think it helped, you know, that having the, all those pressures and all that angst and what have you, you, you put it into the work and, and something, something comes out of it. So it was useful. It's, you had a sort of unusual um, pitch with it, right? Like you'd sort of written half of it and then sent it out yeah. to see if anyone mm -hmm. was interested in it. That Was that an act of faith or was that just yeah. like, that please was just give me some money? That was just financial necessity. I said, my, you know, my agent, I said to my agent, I cannot, you know, it's going to take me another, at least another six months to write this and I can't survive for another six months. So we need to get a deal now. And I knew that it's not the best way to go out and get a book deal when you've only got the book half written. But I was just like, let's get whatever we can. And and we'll see how it goes. Yeah. And um, it w so I was hugely fortunate that l uh, four publishers were immediately interested. So <sighs> there was a huge sigh of relief. Um, and the you know then I knew it was going everything was going to be okay from the from the in the immediate sense at least. Yeah. I think you're being modest. Four publishers. Were it was an actual bidding war, was it not? There, there was a bidding war. Yeah. yeah. Which was yeah. <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> and and great and exciting. Yeah. It yeah. Was it was a crazy turnaround from, you know, a few months before where I was just in the depths of despair. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was crazy. What does it feel like, the middle of a bidding war? Like, uh, is your agent phoning you? Are you waiting by the phone? Are you chortling away at the offers? <laughs> or is it is it over a period of days? Like, what's it? Um, it did happen over a period of days. In fact, it might have been a couple of weeks from start to finish. And, yeah, there's lots of toing and froing and... They're not always structured the same way, so you've got to weigh lots of things up. And you're not just... I mean, what was wonderful is that they, each of the publishers sort of writes you a letter saying what they like about it or the editors and why they want to work on it. And that's such a wonderful thing because basically a bunch of people write you a letter saying, you are amazing and so is your book. <laughs> and like, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so, so that was a wonderful experience given everything had gone before. So, um, yeah, it was, it was really gratifying. But you're not just, a, you know saying who's got the most cash. You're also trying to assess which of the editors you think you'll work best with, what, who's going to, you know, there's a whole bunch of other things that come in, and that's why it's really handy to have a, have a good agent, because they will tell you, like, well, you know, they, they know which publisher's going to gonna do the best job for you, not just for this book, but for the next and the next and the next. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so there's this tendency that we have in literature and in everything else, that there are fashions, there are fads, mm. and... and so Gone Girl was around, and, and there are a couple of other thrillers written by women. Had you read Gone Girl at the time? Do you, did you mind the comparisons? Were you um, happy to be part I of it? I hadn't read it when I started writing, but I think I read... So it's a weird thing that I love Gone Girl, but I can't remember exactly when I read it. Um, I read it that year, definitely, and, and thought it was amazing. And so, I no, I, the c comparisons never bothered me in the sense that it was nice to be, I thought, grouped in with this book, which I loved, I didn't actually think that the books were in incredibly similar. They had a problematic central female protagonist, and there was a missing woman. But you know, there's missing women in lots of books, um, and I suppose yes, it's a marriage story. But it's a very different kind of marriage story because, in Rachel's case, the marriage is long gone. Um, so you know, they were and the, the unreliability was also brought up. But they're <laughs> they're unreliable in very different ways and. Amy Dunn, you know, the Gillian Flynn's protagonist is this woman who's in control of everything, and Rachel is in control of absolutely nothing at all, including herself. So they are actually incredibly different characters, and they're very different storylines. But it, no, it, it certainly didn't bother me. It didn't hurt me <laughs> to be mentioned in the same breath as that. So what's it like to watch the book take off? Like, when were you aware that you had a hit? And what does that feel like? Um, well, I think the thing that was shocking to me in the early days was when it went to number one in the US because that I never expected. It was it debuted at number one in the UK, which was amazing, and here as well, I think, um, which was also amazing. But I'd never imagined that it, that book would do so well in America. Unknown British author and a slightly depressing story about an alcoholic taking the train. You know, this didn't seem to be like the kind of thing that Americans would seize on. So um, that was, and then, you know, if you if you do do well in America, it's a big country. You know that you know things are going well then, yeah. Um, so talk talk about the sort of history of the movie. Were you involved in the movie? How did you feel about selling um, it to the movies? Did, did you go and see the movie? Yeah. Um. I well, I sold 
the rights before the book was even published. So it was optioned literally six months before the book was published, and I, it, lots and lots of things get optioned and never get made. So I was obviously I was excited and it was fun, but I didn't necessarily think that anything was going to happen with it. And when they moved so fast in it, that was you know that was kind of a shock. Um, I wasn't involved in writing it or any of the major decisions. I, I spoke to the producers and the director, and I was comfortable that they that I was in good hands or the story was in good hands. And I visited the set a few times, which is fun. Um, and yes, I went to the premiere and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, I I thought they were they made a, they did a good job with it. They, it was a it was faithful to the spirit of the book and. Um, the darkness and the claustrophobia and the paranoia and all that was in there. And Emily Blunt was a fantastic Rachel. So I was happy with it. Yeah, I mean, you must have thought like, Emily Blunt, this movie's <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was great. And she's, yeah, she's a wonderful actress. But yeah. At what point were you writing book number two? I started that almost immediately having finished The Girl on the Train. And there was actually a gap of about a year almost between finishing The Girl on the Train and its publication. So, which is a great thing, because fortunately I was deep into the water by the time that The Girl on the Train came out and all the craziness started. I already had my idea. I was committed to that story. I knew what I was doing, um, which I think was a, a really good thing, because otherwise it might have been really hard to start a new project with all the insanity going on. Of course, the insanity did interfere with my writing life because necessarily I was touring, I was doing all sorts of things. You, I was, it was distracting and, 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 you, and I didn't have that time to just immerse myself in the writing, which is what I'm happiest doing. So it was a different process and it, it took me a lot longer to write than The Girl on the Train did. It was three years rather than one, start to finish, but a very interrupted three years. Mm -hmm. Mm. How insane was the insanity? Was there? Do you have a? Do you have a, like a book tour story or a crazed fan story? Was uh, no, I'm fortunately touched wood. I don't have any. I haven't got crazed fan stories. But you know, no, it was just a lot of traveling and a, a lot of. It's disconcerting, <laughs> to say the least, to have this happen to you and to suddenly be thrust into the limelight when you're not the sort of person who's used to that and is not necessarily comfortable with that. So, yeah, it yeah. was. Overwhelming. It must have been reassuring then to know because you know everybody does want the second book right away when the mm -hmm. first book is out, and to have that in your, to have that underway, as you say, must have been enormously reassuring. Did did anything about the experience of the first one change the writing of the second one? Did you do it differently? Well, I, I mean, I wrote a very different book, and I, it's I think a lot. It's a more ambitious book. It's you know, it's got this big cast of characters. It's a lot more complex. There are a whole bunch of mysteries going on in this book. Um, so I, d I tried not to think about the, you know, the girl on the train was done. It was a separate entity, and this was my new thing. And I tried not to think too much about what the expectation might be, um, or doing things the same or differently. I mean, there are inevitably those voices in your head, but I did try very hard to just think. Cut that. Write the best. You know, write the best book you can write at this point in time. That's that's always got to be the thing, hasn't it? Stay true to the story you're telling, and do the very best you can with with what's going on in your head at the moment. And that that was the kind of like mantra that kept me going. Just focus on this. Focus on this. Try not to to listen to anything else. Um, let's set the scene briefly for people who haven't had a chance. Um, Into the Water is set in a small town in England, and. <laughs> It's yeah. It's set in a fictional town in the north of England called Beckford, and it's a, a the, the story centres on sisters. Um, and I'm not spoiling anything when I tell you because it happens on like page three that at the beginning of the book one of these sisters is found dead in the in this river, and her younger sister Jules has to come back to this place which she's stayed away from for a very long time for dark and sinister reasons that we will discover later, and she has to sort of unpick not just what to try and sort of work out not just what's led to her sister's untimely demise, but also everything that's happened in their lives to drive them apart and to, you know, to leave them so estranged. And they have this very fraught and they've had this very painful relationship. And she's also got to now look after her sister's grieving 15-year-old daughter, who, and she finds this very difficult because the, the daughter is, you know, the, the sort of um, seems to her like, you know, her, 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 her teenage sister reincarnated somewhat. She's come, you know, she reminds her so much of, of her old sister and of the times when they were really at loggerheads and when her sister bullied her. Um, and there's this whole cast of characters in the small town and we find all the ways in which they're interlinked and all the secrets that they're keeping. Um, 
So yeah, lots of mysteries. Mm -hmm. And again, it's about troublesome women. It's about women who whip yeah. up trouble. The, the woman who dies um, now at the beginning of the book has been writing, a, uh, writing her own book, a kind of memoir slash coffee table book about this river and about every, all the tragedy that has happened around this town and this river for centuries. And her writing of this has proved controversial because she's, she's, she's telling stories that don't necessarily belong to her. She's appropriating other people's stories. She's maybe digging up things that people don't necessarily want disturbed. So she's, she's been ruffling feathers all over town. And can you talk just a little bit about your process? Like, do you have to have it all plotted out? Do you know where you're going from start to finish? Do you have set hours in which you write during the day? I know where I'm going, but I don't. I need to know where I'm going, but I don't like to know how I'm getting there, really. So I need to know who done it and why. But everything, I don't like to plot out in vast detail because then that sort of takes away the spontaneity spontaneity of it. I think the best writing comes when you're right in the thick of it, and that's when you you start making connections in your head that you you wouldn't have made if you were just sitting there plotting. So um, yeah, I need to know where I'm going because I'd be terrified if I didn't that I wouldn't go anywhere at all. So I need to know that sort of that end point. But everything in between, I like to sort of, I like to emerge as I'm in the writing. And there were a lot of these characters in this book that are, that that occurred to me while I was writing. I didn't know every who everybody was, but when I sat down to write it, I knew I had Jules, I had Nell, I had the daughter. I had some bad guys over there, but um, there were a lot of other things that developed during the writing. Why do you like multiple narrators? What does it do for you to have multiple narrators tell your story? I like the immediacy of first-person narration, um, but first-person narration is clearly limited because you can you can only tell one person's story, and they can't, and they can only know a certain number of things. So, in this book. I wanted I wanted the reader to feel like they were hearing this chorus of voices, like they were in this town themselves, them, themselves, and listening to all these people talking to them and trying to figure out who is telling me the truth, who can I trust here. Um, but this is also a community where a lot of people are keeping secrets, and they they sort of they needed to tell their own secrets, and it's it's a lot again about perception, and people's different perspectives on on situations, and so. Uh, Differing um, multiple points of view helps in, in, in that when you're, when you're telling a story like that, to cast different lights on the same incidents. I think one of the things that you do so well is, you know, you have these unreliable narrators, but it's not just a trick. They're sort of organically unreliable. Y at one point you say, so some of it was true and some of it was a lie, and in another writer's hands, that might drive you crazy because you think, well, if some of it's true and some of it's a lie, then they can write anything and I don't have to care. But you managed to do it so that the... It's not just a trick. Can you talk about that a little? Managing well, that. Well, I just I think that all first-person narration is necessarily unreliable because nobody tells the truth. Well, it's not just about truth telling. A, we all lie all the time. Not well, not all the time, but you know, people tell white lies or, or you know, they gloss over things, they obfuscate. But there's also a great degree to which we think we're telling things how they happened, but actually we have we don't remember them how they happened. We Everything is colored by our own perception. But there is also, and this I write about, I talk about this a lot in this book, is that the fallibility of memory, particularly of old memories, of memories of childhood, where we can could absolutely swear that this thing happened exactly how we remember it. And then a sibling or a parent will say, no, it wasn't like that at all. Or uh, what has happened to me is my mother will say, actually, you weren't there. You've just seen a photograph of it. <laughs> You know, or you've heard the story, and you've heard the story so many times, and you've found it an interesting story, so you've inserted yourself into that story when you told your friends. You told them that you were there, and, and you told it so many times it became your truth. So that's, I think, part of the un unreliability. But yes, we also have people who are actively lying, because they are keeping secrets for one reason or another, and those secrets, they're often keeping secrets for good reasons, not necessarily bad ones, to protect someone, or out of loyalty. Um, so... So yes, I, and I, to, to, to the extent that I can, I'm honest with the, I have them be honest with the reader, but they have to lie a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, you have a, did you have a sort of high point writing this where you were like, ah, oh, I can do this, like where it all just sort of click, click, clicked? Uh, there were, I mean, <laughs> it was, a, it was a, as I say, it took a, a while. So there were many moments where I was like, oh yes, this is fantastic. I'm really happy with this bit. And then, then you'd crash the next day or what have you. But there are, 
I liked the, I've, I've included a sort of a historical background to it and we learn about some of the women who lived at this place a long time ago and what happened to them and their demises and they were sort of, they're sort of written as short little pieces spread out through the book and those were a lot of fun to write. They were almost like funny, like little snippets, vignettes that, that are dropped in and I enjoyed those. And I enjoyed the making the connections between the, the various people and allowing those mysteries to kind of cross paths and interweave. And there are there are mysteries which aren't solved in this book, but I think that I like that as well, to leave some things open and to make the reader wonder, you know, what did actually happen there? And we don't know. And we will never know, presumably, since I didn't write it down. <laughs> and I don't know in my own head, you know, what ha what actually is the real truth of this. But that's what I feel like life is like. So mm -hmm. I enjoy that. Are, you've written, there's some haunting sentences, and there's one in particular where you talk about she, how she, your heroine feels like she's slithering out of her skin like a snake and she doesn't like the rawness beneath she doesn't like the smell like it's very haunting sentences are you ever disturbed by your own writing do you ever have to sort of walk away from your is, does it bother your dreams does it um there are times when i sort of creep myself out so i'll be I, when i was writing this quite early on i rented a house in northumberland which is the part of england which i've set this this book and i rented a house by the sea and i was there by myself and there are times at night where i had to like yeah i'm going to i'm going to watch some reality tv now because this is really like a, you know i could hear the footsteps on the stairs and all that kind of thing so yeah i do i do do that to myself and particularly if i'm by myself and particularly if i'm not in a, you know in cities i always feel safe weirdly but anyway that's just me yeah, um, so I can, yeah, I make myself, I creep myself. I don't, and there's also, there's lots of, I mean, there are horrible tragedies in this book. And those are hard to write and hard to think about and hard to put yourself into that situation and imagine how you would feel. There is a grieving mother in this book and she was, it's awful, actually. I mean, she's a necessary part of the story and her pain is a very necessary part of the story. But thinking about that, even though I don't have children of myself, as, as my, uh, children of my own, it's, it's still a very hard thing to think about, a grieving a grieving parent is a horrible thing to think about. Yeah. Um, there are great themes in the book. Uh, you touched on some of them. I wonder if we can talk about it a little bit more. Um, this idea that you can't really know. In, in Girl on the Train, it was sort of you can't really know your spouse. And in this one, I think it's you, c you can't really know your family, the people who are the closest to you. Well, I mean, I yeah, th that's, a, you know, that's a big philosophical question. How, can we ever how much can we ever know anyone? But um, yeah. Here I am picking apart family relationships, particularly a sibling's relationship. Oh, and, and mothers and daughters too. Um, y there are things that you hide from people and, and from your family. And I think that as you go through life, most of the time, you if you have a close family, if you have a, a functional family, you will talk about things. But how many of us have like close functional families? <laughs> most of us have some el level of dysfunction. Um, I think I talk a lot about how, how well parents will know their, their children. And of course, all parents want to think they know their children completely, but nobody really knows what teenagers are up to and what they're really thinking because it's such a weird time, that crossing from childhood to adulthood and the, the things you think and the things you believe and the, the confidences you have or the um, insecurities. So that is necessarily a time that's fraught with misunderstandings. And usually, I think you wor work through them. And the, the sisters, Nell and Jules, again, they, they just misunderstand each other terribly. And it's one of those uh, tragedies where they should have worked it out. But for, for this particular reason, they haven't. And so they've been stuck in this horrible teenage um, antipathy. And I think Jules thinks is, is, is does still behave like an adolescent when she thinks about her sister, when she imagines conversations with her sister. They're, they're very adolescent conversations. They are stunted because they haven't worked through all those problems. Um, so I don't think it's impossible to know people, but I think m very few of us actually get to know, well, you know, it's, it's also fiction. So we, ha we, need, we need some conflict there. We need some mystery. <laughs> It's fiercely feminist, though, and, and there's, this, there's this really interesting strain through it that women kind of go through their lives expecting violence to happen to them at some point, that we're, that we're not surprised when violence happens to us, that we're, that we're sort of surprised when it doesn't on some level. I think there is a degree to which women are taught from um, quite a young age 
to think of themselves as potential victims. In a way, I believe that men are not. Now, you can argue with me about this, but I think women are, are told about all the things they should do in order to avoid being victims of violence. Don't wear high heels, don't wear a short skirt, don't drink too much, don't smile at the guy at the bar, don't take a taxi home, don't do X, Y, and Z. Or because you, it's, it's, it's almost like it's your responsibility to avoid being a victim of violence. The weird thing is men are far more likely to be victims of violence than women are. But we don't tell men not to go to the pub. We don't tell them how to dress. We don't tell them not to walk home alone at night. It's kind of not seen as their responsibility to avoid being a victim. But it very much is the way we talk. You know, we teach women that they have to do all these things as though it was somehow their responsibility. So yes, I think it, that inevitably, I'm sure most of the women here will will have had that feeling of, you know, oh God, have I done the stupid thing by, by you know, by walking home on this route and you walk with your keys in your hand and you look over your shoulder and you're, all those things that women do all the time, which I don't think men do, unless, but I'm saying this in very general terms um, and obviously there are places in which everyone feels insecure, but I'm talking about sort of Western countries, uh, you know, Toronto or London or New York. Um, women perhaps behave in a, in a different way because they see themselves as potential victims because they've always been told that it's their responsibility to avoid being a victim. And there's also a streak of the violence that women do to themselves, you know, the, the yeah. way they betray their friendships or the way they hate their own bodies. Or uh, There's a lot of that in this book as yeah, well. Yeah, and again, I mean, I think that's something we've all, in this, we've all had probably throughout our lives, and I wonder whether it's actually worse now because of the constant social media, um, you know, constantly taking pictures of oneself, and, I, and I'm not like necessarily anti the selfie, but I know that I, I, I'm pretty sure it would have made me feel desperately insecure if I'd had to look at pictures of other girls all the time when I was a teenager. Um, yeah, and we do, we are, again, taught by society that we, you know, to that only a certain kind of way of looking is acceptable. And so then that, that kind of thing breeds a self-loathing and a defensiveness and a defensiveness that may, may make you go on the attack. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there, we're gonna run it open, sorry. We are going to open this up to your questions in just a minute. Um, but I am just gonna ask you a couple more questions. Um, this is a very indelicate question, so feel free to tell me to get lost, but um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the impact of a book, and d does having a successful book, does it free your mind in a certain way? Like, can you now take more risks with your next books because you have a cushion? Is there, mm -hmm. is there, I'd like to believe that, you know, money would help me. <laughs> is that true? Um, I, didn't, I didn't think that, the, I mean, obviously it's nice to be, to have, you know, I'm not gonna lie that it's, uh, to say it's terrible to have money isn't terrible to have money. Um, I'm not sure that it, ha it, uh, it necessarily is affecting my autistic process at the moment. I think the, th the success in itself, the being known is more likely to affect it. And I hope that I will continue to take risks and to, to try new things. That's what I want to do. I don't want to you know, be writing the same story. I've seen some critics suggest that I should have just written The Girl on the Train 2 or tried to, what they call, they said, repeat the trick. And I was thinking, what was the trick? I didn't even think there was, a, was there a trick? I didn't know, what, well, if somebody needs to tell me what the trick was, because I didn't know, I just wrote a story. And this time I wrote a different novel, and the next time I've, I've already got some ideas for, for characters, and I wanna do something else, which will, I hope will be ambitious. And I would rather be ambitious and fall slightly short than, than just be trying to repeat the same thing over and over. So I hope that that will continue, but obviously having success means that you also get scrutiny, and that can be painful. So, but you know, I do think there's, a, there's a, a sense in which sometimes, I think, well, this is my new theory, that writing um, is a bit like being a sport, like a football fan. There's always next season. Even if you're having a terrible season, there's always next season. So, it, you know, there's always the next book. There's al the next book is perfect at the moment because I haven't messed it up yet. So, you know, there's, there's hope in that and you can move forward to the next thing and I hope I will continue to be ambitious. The fact that I don't, I suppose going back, well, I'm being very rambly, sorry, but going back to your question about money, that I don't have to sell a lot of books next time. I mean, obviously my publishers would like me to sell a lot of books next time, but I'm not gonna be on the breadline if I don't. So that I guess is freeing. I can afford to take the take some, you know, to try something new and to, to be ambitious in my writing. 
Did you allow yourself an extravagance? Was there something that you were delighted to be able to do? I mean, I haven't gone crazy, but I, I bet the... I, I'm, I moved into a, a nice, a much nicer apartment than I used to live in, and um, I taken some some really good holidays. So yeah, I I took a bunch of friends to a fancy ski resort and that kind of thing. So yeah, we'd had fun. <laughs> so my last question is, you know, given that you're writing the kind of books that you are, uh, do you believe that we're capable of anything? That all of us, any of us, is capable of anything, really? Well, I mean, I, there are probably limits to that, but I think, yes, I think under the right circumstances, people can behave in extraordinary ways, and I don't just mean in extraordinarily bad ways. Um, in in all sorts of extraordinary ways, I think about people coming to Europe from Syria, for example, and probably five years ago, those people were doctors and teachers and what have you, living in this middle-class lives in a city, and they would never for an instant have dreamed that they could possibly contemplate putting themselves and their children into a boat and crossing the Mediterranean. But they are now, because, and so, you know, we, none of us could imagine doing that, but if we were having our cities bombed, we, we might find ourselves pushed to those extremes too. So I think, um, yes, given the right circumstances, people are capable of utterly extraordinary things. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. We really appreciate it.